second reading, Mr Jesse Norman. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam uh, Chairman. It's a delight to speak under your chairmanship. Um, I beg to move that the bill now be read a second time. Uh, in three weeks' time, the transition period will end and this country will take its place uh, as a fully sovereign trading nation once more. Uh, it is a very important moment in our nation's history, one that will undoubtedly provide us with great opportunity in the years ahead. But the government is acutely aware that at this time it also has a great responsibility to provide certainty to people and businesses and to preserve this nation's uh, unity. And the fundamental purpose of this bill is to achieve those goals. This legislation seeks to ensure that businesses in every part of the UK can continue to trade smoothly after the end of the transition period. But its particular focus is on those businesses that are based in Northern Ireland or that work with Northern Ireland companies. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, chair, the government has always been clear that it must deliver on its pledge to provide unfettered access for Northern Ireland's businesses to the rest of the UK internal market. And it has been equally unstinting in its determination to uphold its commitments to the people of Northern Ireland under the Northern Ireland Protocol and to protect the progress made under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. This bill will help to support those commitments by providing legal certainty for the customs, VAT and excise systems in Northern Ireland after the end of the transition period. If I may, I will start with the customs elements of the bill. The House will know that the UK is a single customs territory, with Article 4 of the Northern Ireland Protocol giving a clear uh, legal commitment to this. However, the Protocol also requires a new and unique set of arrangements to be put in place for goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Under these arrangements, the only circumstance in which tariffs should be charged on goods moving between Great Britain and Northern Ireland is if those goods are destined for the EU single market or if there is a clear and substantial risk that they may be. Of course. Grateful to the Minister for giving way in this second reading debate before we get to committee. Would he confirm that under these proposals in this last legislation, the ECJ will be the ultimate arbiter over excise and VAT arrangements within Northern Ireland and that they will be placing staff in our country to supervise this? Well, I, I, um, the uh, VAT in Northern Ireland will be subject to uh, uh, EU uh, principal VAT uh, directive, and uh, for that purpose, the uh, ECJ will be the uh, judicial body. Uh, I can't comment as to uh, whether or not there will be anything more than staff, but except to say that uh, excise processes in Northern Ireland will be carried out by uh, Her Majesty's Revenue uh, and Customs. <laughs> Madam Chairman. By his right honourable friend, if the ECJ would be the ultimate arbiter, uh, the Minister replied that it would be judicial authority. Is that the same thing? Yes, I was simply paraphrasing. I was simply paraphrasing the point that uh, uh, the honourable gentleman, the honourable gentleman, has made. Uh, under the terms of the protocol, uh, Madam Chairman, this means that we need to treat goods at risk of such onward movement into the EU differently from those goods which are not uh, at risk. On the specific details of what will be defined as at risk or not at risk, the House will be aware of the EU-UK joint agreement made this week setting out that an agreement has been reached in principle regarding the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. In accordance with that statement, the draft text will now be subject to further consideration in both the EU and the UK. Once that is complete, a joint committee will be convened to adopt them formally. Further details will be set out in due course and before the end of the year. Um, in reply to my right honourable friend, the member for Wokingham, um, and the Honourable Gentleman opposite, uh, the question of jurisdiction was raised, which is perhaps the best way to use the right expression, rather than paraphrasing. Uh, the fact remains that the EU officials uh, will uh, be there for the purposes of enforcing the jurisdiction of the European uh, legal arrangements, which will be enforced subject to the European Court. So in those circumstances, will you now accept that actually there is an infringement of sovereignty in respect of this because the notwithstanding clauses have been taken out, therefore further complication, but it, um, if I may just add, slightly somewhat, if I may say respectfully, in contradiction of his alle allegation that we would now take over as a sovereign, fully independent power. Mm. Minister. 
uh, well, I thank the gentleman for the question. Uh, uh, he is right that uh, it is expected that there will be EU officials. The uh, checks will be levied uh, and done by HMRC uh, inspectors, and the system that we are, the system that we are putting in place uh, gives effect to a Northern, Irish protocol, Northern Ireland Protocol, which, as he will recognise, already uh, recognises the balance that is being struck uh, in Northern Ireland between its status under the Union Customs Code uh, and its status within the UK uh, customs system. Madam Chairman, if I may proceed, the Bill will allow the Government to put in place decisions made by the Joint Committee on goods that are not at risk of entering the EU, ensuring that they do not have to pay the EU tariff. However, if I may underline, this Bill does not itself seek to specify the classes or categories of goods or movements which are at risk or not at risk. Instead, this will be set out by regulations this Bill permits us to make once legal texts have been formally adopted. The at-risk or not-at-risk definitions will also determine whether the UK or EU tariff applies when goods arrive in Northern Ireland from the rest of the world countries, again in line with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, in relation to the so-called notwithstanding uh, clauses, uh, as part of yesterday's uh, EU-UK joint statement, the Government has agreed not to introduce these provisions into this Bill, and it is also committed to remove uh, the three notwithstanding clauses from the UK Internal Market Bill. This Chairman follows... I suspect we're going to come round this many times, but I'm happy to give away again. Time. Uh, could I just simply say to my honourable gentleman, my honourable friend, that this does raise a question. I'm not going to go into an intervention with him, but I will in my speech, because actually I believe that those provisions may well be needed because we don't know the outcome of the negotiations yet. I'll leave it at that point for the moment. We don't know, but we've been told they're going to come out. The question of whether they should have been put in is a separate question, which I dealt with yesterday. I'm not quite sure where that was uh, heading, Madam Chairman, but um, we have the bill in the form we have in front of us, and the government has, has made clear that the so-called notwithstanding clause is, will not be introduced into this bill. Uh, this legislation follows from commitments made in the government's command paper on the implementation of the protocol, which was published in May of this year. The bill will ensure that EU goods moving into Northern Ireland remain free from customs duties or processes. And although we recognise and are addressing uh, challenges uh, relating to the movement of goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, we should not lose sight, if I may add, of the benefits to Northern Ireland of continuing access to the EU market. In addition, this legislation will ensure that the UK customs regime applies to goods moved from Northern Ireland to Great Britain if they do not qualify for unfettered access. The bill will also introduce anti-avoidance rules to prevent goods being rerouted through Northern Ireland to avoid UK customs duties or associated obligations. And its measures will ensure that customs enforcement and penalties, along with review and appeal processes, uh, are in place in relation to duty and that they continue to work alongside EU legislation in Northern Ireland and can be applied where required to movements of goods between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Of course. Uh, to the Minister of Giving Way, and uh, I, I now welcome the thrust of this um, uh, bill today. Could I just ask on the anti-avoidance uh, approach? Uh, we've heard that th this word been used uh, quite a, a lot over recent months, but we've never seen any detail as to how that's going to work. And this is a critical issue, particularly for the agri-food sector in Northern Ireland, to make sure that there isn't inferior product coming in to Northern Ireland and taking advantage of the protocol, and also given the, the risk of organised crime uh, in, in Ireland as well. So when are, we, when are we going to see detail around exactly how that's going to look? Well, very grateful, uh, gentlemen. As he will know, uh, goods that are, as it were, normally circulating in Northern Ireland will be uh, open uh, from the beginning to go into uh, uh, Great Britain. Uh, there will be some goods uh, over time which will be designated as non-qualifying uh, goods for purposes of that, and uh, HMRC has well-established practices for identifying and discussing those uh, and, and uh, targeting those uh, as uh, may be necessary, and will be applying them in order to prevent uh, avoidance and uh, keep the market uh, honest, as it were. Uh, in order, uh, uh, as I have said, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, the bill will uh, let ensure that the UK customs regime applies to goods moved from Northern Ireland, uh, moving from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, if they do not qualify for unfettered access. Uh, these anti-avoidance rules will prevent goods from being rerouted through Northern Ireland to avoid UK customs duties or associated obligations, and its measures will ensure that customs enforcement and penalties, uh, along with review and appeal processes, continue to work along 
side EU legislation in Northern Ireland and can be applied where required to movements of goods between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Turning to uh, VAT and excise, the Bill also amends and modifies certain provisions in relation to VAT and excise for Northern Ireland. I'm very grateful to uh, the Minister for giving way. We remember in, in many of these um, debates that have taken place in the last four years, the Government previously um, was referring to frictionless trade between um, the uh, mainland and Northern Ireland. The Government now says it wants VAT accounting treatment for goods uh, moving between Great Britain and Northern Ireland to remain as close as possible to the current approach. So can the Minister confirm whether we've now accepted that frictionless trade is not possible? And can you tell us a little more about what as close to possible uh, actually means for businesses in Northern Ireland who are looking forward to the 1st of January with some trepidation? I thank the Honourable for his question. Um, yes, I mean, the, the uh, legal basis on which VAT will be charged changes. I will spare you the details of uh, the difference between uh, import VAT and acquisition VAT, but it will change. But the experience that will uh, uh, be had by those who uh, are paying VAT will be uh, very, very similar, if not identical, to the system that we have in place at the moment. And um, HMRC and the government have identified flexibilities which allow that to be put in place. Uh, of course, there will continue to be um, uh, uh, the normal processes of enforcement that one would expect to see from HMRC in order to make sure that VAT is properly paid in the usual, in the usual way. Uh, if I may just proceed, um, in relation to VAT, uh, I'm sorry? I, I, I'm having to take another, I'm, I'm going to make some progress, but let me take this first. Very kind of the Minister, but th these are urgent and important issues. We heard earlier from the Chancellor of the Duchy uh, that there are various delays in the full implementation of trade arrangements uh, into and out of Northern Ireland as a result of his negotiations. Will they be incorporated in this legislation and do they provide a break on the immediate introduction of these complex double taxation arrangements? I have no doubt the Chancellor will be updating the House over time as uh, the different provisions that he has negotiated come into force. Uh, but uh, from our point of view, the position remains uh, as stated. That is to say that a VAT will become chargeable by a slightly different legal means, but in substantially the same way in Northern Ireland as it is uh, at the moment. And the mechanisms we have put in place uh, are designed to ensure that as far as possible VAT will be accounted for as well in the same way as it is today. Existing rules in relation to movements of goods between Northern Ireland and the EU, including the rules relating to acquisitions and distance selling, will continue to apply. Goods entering Great Britain from Northern Ireland will be subject to VAT as though they were imports and to the relevant UK legislation. Similarly, goods entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain will also be subject to VAT as though they were imports and relevant EU or UK legislation will apply. But if I may, let me add that the Government is adopting an approach that minimises any changes for goods moving between uh, Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, can you perhaps clarify for myself whether members, when they are in the chamber, should be socially distancing by staying on seats which have ticks on them? Thank you for the uh, point of order. Yep, that is what the ticks are there for. And uh, I hope that uh, all members will abide by that so that we will be allowed to have safe social distancing. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, uh, in addition, this bill amends current legislation for excise duty to be charged when certain goods, such as alcohol and tobacco, are moved from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. These changes are necessary to ensure there is a fully functioning VAT and excise regime in place in relation to Northern Ireland at the end of the transition period. In line with the protocol, Northern Ireland will maintain alignment with existing EU excise rules. That means a change to excise duty is required when goods are moved to Northern Ireland from Great Britain. But the Government is adopting an approach using flexibilities in the EU rules that minimises changes for excise goods moving between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. There are also a small number of other taxation measures that need to be in place before the end of the transition period. This bill introduces a new system for collecting VAT on cross-border goods. Uh, that includes moving VAT collection on certain imported goods away from the border and involving operators of online marketplaces in the collection of VAT at the point of sale. In addition, measures in the bill will remove the VAT relief on imported low-value items so that VAT will be due on all consignments irrespective of their value. 
This relief has been the subject of long-standing abuse, and removing it will build on government efforts to level the playing field for UK businesses still further by protecting high streets from VAT-free imports. Together, these changes will improve the effectiveness of VAT collection on imported goods, tackle non-compliance, and protect the flow of goods at the border. Yes, of course. I uh, very much support the measures he's talking about. Um, why just low-value goods? There'll be other goods that, where a similar loophole applies, for example, watches or jewellery that are of value above £135. Does, is this not an opportunity to close that loophole as well? well I, I, I thank the Honourable for his question, um, uh, and I will uh, take it under review. Um, what we have put in place here is a set of measures designed to uh, tidy up the position, particularly arising in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol, as you'll be aware, in the transition, end of the transition period, and that has meant a change to low-value consignment relief and the changes I've described, but I'm grateful to him for his contribution and suggestion. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Bill also includes provision for an increase in the rate of duty on aviation gasoline, which will apply across the UK. Uh, otherwise known as Avgas, the fuel is a form of leaded petrol predominantly used in uh, leisure flying. The goods made by Clause 6 of the Bill will increase the Avgas rate by half of a penny to 38.2 pence per litre from the 1st of January next year. By way of explanation, the Northern Ireland Protocol requires that Northern Ireland continues to comply with the EU's Energy Taxation Directive following the end of the transition period. This sets a minimum level of duty in euros on leaded petrol used for propulsion. After some careful consideration, the Government has chosen to apply the change to the whole of the UK in order to ensure consistency between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, to avoid burdens on business and to reduce compliance risks for HMRC. The Bill also includes a clause to ensure HMRC have access to the same tools to prevent insurance premium tax evasion uh, as they do, uh, or similar as present, regardless of whether an insurer is based in an EU member state. Overseas insurers are liable to pay insurance premium tax when they supply general insurance for UK located risks. Occasionally, overseas insurers do not pay the insurance premium tax they owe, and so it's important HMRC have access to tools that deter and tackle. Uh, this form of evasion. Up till now, they have been using EU provisions to prevent evasion by insurers based in EU member states. While separately, they can issue liability notices in cases involving insurers based in any country outside of the EU with which the UK does not have a mutual assistance uh, agreement. Since the EU uh, provisions expire at the end of the transition period, this clause will enable HMRC to issue liability notices in evasion cases involving insurers based in any country with which the UK does not have a mutual assistance agreement, including EU member states. Finally, the Bill include, introduces new powers that will enable HMRC to raise tax charges under the Controlled Foreign Companies legislation for the period from 1 January 2013 to the 31st of December 2018. This is a technical provision that will deal efficiently with a legacy state aid decision relating to the period before the UK left the European Union. Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill will give people and businesses throughout the UK certainty about the arrangements that will apply from the 1st of January next year. It will play a part in further safeguarding the unity and integrity of this country, both in the months ahead and long into the future, and I commend the bill to the House. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. And before I call Annalise Dodds, just to say that uh, the wind-ups will begin at uh, five o'clock, uh, with um, or five o'clock at the latest, um, and that there are 13 members in to speak, and uh, they're all here. So you know there's going to be 13 uh, that are definitely speaking, and so therefore you should really be thinking about six minutes. Even if I don't put the clock on, it would be really useful if everybody at least shows some uh, discipline on that so that everybody can get a fair crack of the whip. Annalise Dodds. Yeah. Thank you. It's a year to the day since the Chancellor boasted that there was no need to plan for no deal because we will have a deal. Yet today, as we debate this bill, we stand on the brink of a no deal Brexit that would destroy jobs and livelihoods right across the United Kingdom. We have only 22 days to go until the end of the transition period, with still no deal in sight. Now, when we debated the ways and means resolutions associated with this bill yesterday, a number of members opposite claimed that agreements between nations are often only finalised at the last minute, that there's nothing out of the ordinary about this government's approach. But that's because 
for run-of-the-mill agreements, there's a fallback option. There's a status quo. But failing to reach a deal now does not mean a return to the status quo, that we stay as we are. It means extensive economic damage to the tune of an additional 2% loss of GDP on top of the 4% loss of GDP that the OBR has calculated would be the impact of a very thin deal, the type of thin as gruel deal that the Conservatives look set to deliver. I will give way. I'm grateful to her for giving way, and she's absolutely right. But those, even those statistics that she refers to there about the overall impact on the economy mask the absolutely catastrophic impact that no deal would have on individual business and individual industries. If you go to the Toyota factory, as I had the pleasure of doing in Derby, no deal means that, that entire, the entire purpose of that factory being based in Derby is called into serious threat. So it, it's really important, alongside those statistics about the overall impact, we recognise for individual...